And we are uh, live. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome. Uh, cold, wet Tuesday here in Ireland, and there we've got my colleague, uh, we've got Jim McDonald, all the way from uh, uh, sunny Montreal. <laughs> How are things, Jim? Things are good. Snowy as usual. We got another uh, six inches last night, so just another day in the life here in Montreal. Yes, it's uh, yeah, but as you say, nothing ever sort of comes to a. Uh, Nothing ever comes to a halt there. You're, you guys are pretty well. Uh, you guys are pretty good, pretty well set up for for bad weather. Yeah, I think there was a story recently that Montreal has the best uh, snow removal um, team kind of in the world. So that's one of our big claims to fame. Airports don't close. No, exactly. Uh, and uh, how's things? I mean, you, 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 so tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, Jim. You're you're originally from the states, uh, Chicago. Or Illinois area. Yeah, so I grew up in the States. I was trained as a podiatrist, uh, started my um, education at Shoal College after my undergraduate degree, and then uh, did three years of surgical residency training uh, out in Portland, Oregon, and practiced for five years at a, a big orthopedic surgical clinic in Eugene, Oregon, which is kind of the uh, the home of athletics and track and field uh, in the States. Yeah, I mean, that's where they have the whole Nike uh, experiment. Well, yeah. So outside Portland and Beaverton is the Nike headquarters. Um, and then about two hours south of Beaverton is uh, Eugene, where the University of Oregon is. The um, 2021 World Championships were supposed to be held there. Um, so it's um, they also have some elite teams. They have uh, the Oregon Track Club elite there in Eugene. So definitely a lot of uh, high profile runners came in and out of our town. Mm -hmm. uh, and you used to see quite a lot of runners and sort of sports medicine wise side of things. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I was one of the junior kind of associates in the practice for a while, so I wasn't seeing the uh, the heavy hitters to start off with, but uh, definitely some of my uh, older colleagues. Uh, one of the guys in my group, a guy by the name of Stan James, was actually the orthopedic surgeon who did the arthroscopic knee surgery on Joan Benoit Samuelson, um, basically like four weeks before her marathon trials, and then she went on to be the first marathon Olympic champion ever for women, was in my practice, and then he also treated... Steve Prefontaine and just, you know, a laundry list of other kind of high profile runners came through. And I was one of the younger guys, but they, he would sometimes drag me into the room and, you know, get my my thoughts on something or I'd help, you know, construct an orthotic for someone that had a, you know, second metatarsal head was longer, you know, second metatarsal was longer than the, the first and needed a little bit of offloading, you know, some yes. different ways as far as um, biomechanics with some of those athletes. Uh -huh. Uh, and then, of course, I mean, you went on then after that. I mean, you were quite involved with the sort of Canadian athletics on the on the. Yeah. So in uh, 2008, I met a uh, wonderful, wonderful woman from the uh, province of Quebec, and uh, I was still in practice at the time. And then, basically, what happened over the course of those years, I started doing some different technology side projects, making some iPhone apps, uh, developing some websites around the kind of high performance running area. Mm -hmm. um, while I liked doing some of the day-to-day um, -day clinical practice and treating patients, I found myself drawn more to kind of the performance side of the sport and trying to do some things to help kind of up the sports game from a technology standpoint. So I used some of my doctor money back then to fund some side projects, but along with creating the technology, you have to find some way of getting it in front of people. Um, and that's how I kind of got interested in marketing and kind of uh, basically my wife has offered a position uh, at a university in her hometown of Montreal um, and it seemed like a good way for me to transition gradually from clinical practice into yeah. something more along the lines of technology or communications. But it's just interesting what you said there. I mean, it's uh, you spent some of your money on these things, but then you had to market them to actually get people to find them. And yeah, I mean, I have that conversation regularly, uh, you know, yeah. with friends and colleagues. And they think if they're going to have this nice new fancy, say, website with all the bells and whistles, then they've no idea then that they actually. Well, how are you going to actually get people to see it and use it? No, exactly. It's in the states. Yeah. There's a movie called Field of Dreams, and I'm not sure if your your audience is familiar with it. But uh, in Field of Dreams, there's a famous line: "It's if you build it, they will come." Oh, yeah. And uh, the the sad part about that is that if they don't know you exist, they can't go anywhere. Um, yeah. So you do have to have some awareness for whatever yeah. your your project you're doing. I mean, one of my first tastes of that was about. 10 years or so ago when my brother in Australia decided to head off and he got it's some web training engineering app or website that he's going to develop. And of course he flew to Sydney and the developers 
brought him out to lunch and blew smoke up his ass and said, yeah, yeah, sure. You know, took about 30, 35,000 to develop the website. Yeah. Luckily, before he signed the contract, we had a quick word. It's like, great. But then how are you going to actually get drive traffic to that? How are people going to find out about you? We spent all this money on the great, lovely website that does everything for you. Where are you going to get? And people, you know, companies <laughs> larger than our multi-million dollar companies burn through huge amounts of venture capital cash trying to get a, a, a brand, a product recognition. No, I totally agree. I agree. And what happens sometimes is that especially you hire someone to do it for you, there's all these milestones and these things that they'll hit, but that doesn't necessarily guarantee success, right? And whether it's an app or a website, things are always changing. So there's always more develop work, development work that needs to be done. So if you don't have a partner or you partner with someone, you're basically going to be paying through the nose um, to make a little, you know, if you want it to be on Android and iOS, you want it to be, you know, good on Chrome browser and Safari browser. It's not just, uh, you know, build this one thing and then the revenue comes in, right? Yeah, it's uh, if only were that easy. <laughs> and the uh, and and so I mean, did you find then at, at that stage that sort of athletics and and, and, the, and the Canadian athletics were sort of quite open open to this, or is this is the you're obviously sort of riding the sort of wave of the technology through with this? Yeah. So what I found was that like, you know, when I was, I'm from the States, I grew up in the States. I was a runner myself. Um, it's a very competitive sport in the U.S., as you might imagine. Um, sometimes they say that the uh, U.S. Olympic trials is the second most competitive sport or a competition after the Olympics. And what you have, you know, I was a 153, 154 half miler and I was maybe, you know, number 500 or 600 with never a chance to even think about going there, right? So it's a pretty big sport in the US, the NCA system, it's huge. But when I moved to Canada, while we have some very high quality athletes here, um, and the sport is just kind of a little bit more under the radar. Um, a lot of the athletes go down to the US to compete. Um, yeah. you know, obviously it's colder up here all year. We don't have California or Florida. And those are like here from Ireland and from the UK. I mean, there's scholarships, obviously, for Canadian athletes. In the yeah, state. exactly, exactly. People will, you know, like one of our stars, Justin Knight, went to Syracuse. You know, Derek Drew, our Olympic champion, high jumped at the University of Indiana. So there are athletes that are a high level uh, that go down to the U.S. Um, what I found is that the, the kind of Canadian system and Athletics Canada is kind of the federation. It's, um, you know, it's a, it's a good it's a good federation, but obviously the, the volume isn't there. So, you know... Yeah. What, you know, what, if I was doing media, if I was doing stuff in the US and I wanted to get access, there's all these kind of hurdles you have to jump through. And I was able to, you know, get access. Um, but like when you come to Canada, you just say, I went to the Canadian Championships in Moncton, New Brunswick for the first time. And I introduced myself to the COO, the CEO. They knew my name. They knew I was going to go um, check out the 2013 Moscow World Championships. I was going to pay my way. Um, mm -hmm. They knew I was going and I could cover some Canadian athletes. Like, well, We'll pay half of your flight to Moscow. So okay. it, it just you get to know people on a much more basic level because there's these less of these things to jump through because it's just a bit of a smaller sport here in Canada. Yeah, and I mean you just you just pitched up. I mean because that's always the way. I mean cer certain uh, with with certain people or we just got in contact over the years. And as you go out, I mean a, a lot of practitioners think these sort of things are going to just happen to them. Yeah, uh, unless they make it happen. So yeah, unless you turn up with that sort of attitude. Uh, I just want to be a value to people, right? Like, you know, I had a certain, after living in Oregon and Eugene for a decade, you can, I kind of knew the high level aspects of the sport. I knew the coaches, the athletes, and it just gave me a bit of credibility when I came in. Yes, yeah, so you've got to be able to talk running specific issues to uh, to runners with they're doing their sort of fart leg runs or they're doing sort of intervals or doing sort of things. So you need to be on the same page as them. Uh, across so i mean yeah sometimes that can be sort of a little bit d difficult to get up to uh to speed but if you get any advice for sort of people who want to sort of get involved say in athletics or or, or you know any other type of sort of sports specific yeah so i would say like like you talked about like whether it's a sports niche or any other kind of niche within podiatry i think that's one of the things that people sometimes you know i'm already a foot and ankle specialist right so why do i need to go down into a deeper niche um and what i say it's, it's really about becoming domain expert with the type of patients you want to treat, right? Um, so whether it's basketball players or football players or you know athlete, uh, athletes, um, you know with athletics, you really would just want to you know kind of become that go-to expert. So I mean, with the internet, all that information about the coaches, the training, all that stuff is available. 
It's a matter of you then learning about those things and maybe what specific injuries or need is there and then positioning yourself as an expert uh, in those different niches. Yeah, and I mean, again, whether it's sort of, you know, everybody will have their sort of own interests, whether it's athletics or sort of cycling or, or sort of basketball or, or, you know, rugby or something like that. But again, you know, it's, it's always good to be able to work in something that you sort of have an interest in then as, uh, uh, as well. And of course, there's quite a crossover between, you know, the biomechanics is the same, just sports specifically, it'll be slightly, uh, it'll be slightly, uh, it'll be slightly different. Uh, of course, interesting times this year, I mean, Know what the latest was on, on the Olympics this morning, whether that's going to continue on or not. Yeah, it's a big question right now, right? Like, uh, what's going to happen with Tokyo 2021? So, uh, we'll have to wait and see, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I know a couple of Irish athletes were, you know, again, last March, April kicked in, and I mean, they were just sort of on their uptrend for their you know, really sort of kicking into higher sort of gear. So, that's all been sort of paused. And as you say, I mean, certainly Ireland. And certain sports is at a quite a lower level, not a lower lower level, but as within uh, within Canada. So you're we'll be worried about sort of funding if, there's, if it's going to be another four year cycle and, and different things. They're not not as well resourced as some of the uh, as some of the uh, uh, the other countries. Uh, no, for sure, I, I totally get that. I mean, I think uh, it's just a it's whether athletes should jump the line. There's all these kind of moral and uh, moral and kind of. Uh, logistical dimensions. I know that we've had a bit of a slower rollout with the COVID vaccine here in Canada than people really wanted. I um, mean, mm -hmm. obviously the manufacturing, both kind of being in the US and a lot in Europe, you know, is whether we're going to get some doses or not. So there's always that going on there. But I mean, I've, obviously athletes are used to adapting. Obviously they had to push off, you know, a year already, but, um, you know, a lot of them are pretty resilient people. Otherwise they wouldn't be in sport in the first place. I know that when I was younger and I was getting into sport, I was a middle distance runner, right? And uh, some of my favorite middle distance runners are from Ireland, you know, like uh, Marcus O'Sullivan, Eamon yeah. Coughlin. Like those are guys that when oh, US sure. running was down a little bit, like I was, you know, tuned into those guys. Yeah, well, well Tom Novella, who we spoke with before, I mean, he worked with, uh, uh, he worked with, uh, just mentioned him, the, the, in what, for the mile indoor record. Uh, Eamon, Eamon, Eamon or Eamon Marcus? Marcus? Sorry, Eamon Coughlin. Probably, yeah. indoor record and Tom just through uh, I think it was through Adidas got uh, got, got working with him. Okay. And it's uh, and and yeah, so there we know it can be sort of like quite niche, and of course that's what a lot of sort of practices or uh, a lot of practices maybe tend to be a little bit sort of too generalized. I'm not talking about in the, in the service that they provide, but uh, uh, especially in the sort of their in their marketing and the message that they give across to. Uh, to, uh, to 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 prospective patients, and uh, everybody's heard that they need to sort of niche. Uh, so I suppose like specialising in and more sort of sports specific stuff is one way to do that. But, yeah, there's a fear there sometimes, right? If you they feel if they like niche too much, that like you know, then the ingrown toenails or the heel pain is going to go to somebody else. But that's generally not the case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's. Uh, and, but it's a good way of building then that sort of like trust and sort of name, name recognition and things that we uh, that we've talked about before, and and, and so with, with, with your um, with, with the practice sort of mastery uh, company that you have, I mean you really sort of focus on really into well we'll we'll tell us a little bit later a little bit more about the, the sort of process that you like to go through with people that you work with. Yeah, so there's kind of two. So I kind of do two things. One, obviously, you mentioned is the uh, the podiatry practice mastery, and that's kind of a, a mastermind group or a monthly group that I work with a podiatrist named um, Don Pelto, and we kind of have this group together. And then there's my kind of my personal business, which is podiatry growth. And with yes. podiatry growth, I work with private uh, practice podiatrists to kind of help them develop their online presence through kind of like a, a framework or kind of what I call like the five elements of a uh, clinical online presence. And the first being kind of a you know an online foundation. The second being uh, kind of discovery. Uh, third being uh, more in the lines of reputation. Four being yeah. communication, and number five being kind of promotion. So we sort of touched on that a little bit, like in terms of the website is the uh, you got to be you got to be there. Plus then you get to get people to, to recognize that that you're that you're that you're there. Uh, and so what, what are the sort of typical mistakes that you see people make? Well, I think you, number one is like you have to have imagery of you and your staff and of like kind of the ideal patient on the website, especially on the homepage. When people people want to see human faces, they don't want to see a 
footprint in the sands or like just a disembodied foot kind of sitting there. Um, while that's better than nothing, it's not really gonna like build trust with that person. If the person looking at your website sees them in the, the patient chair, you know, that's what you wanna have them feel like. It's like, I wanna be treated by this person because it looks like he's treating someone like me or a problem like I have. So that's the first kind of mistake is that people just make it very generic and it's not their fault, right? We didn't go to school for this. No, um, again, if you contact the designers and I've made this mistake in the past, they just come back with sort of generic, uh, you know, stock photos that are, that, are, that are used there. Yeah, stock stock images are not really gonna build any trust or a rep, kind of a good build a rapport with that patient. Yeah, and of course then, I mean, even more, even if it's just sort of photographs, certainly introductory videos were a huge help uh, in, in, in our practices. Yeah. Again, so they get to know, like, and trust you. Uh, because again, I think people, again, lots of websites, of course, are set up for the, for the buy now, the patient who wants the appointment today type of patient. And which, are, which, are, which, which um, I think there's more patients are looking for more information and a more to, and a, or more of a, yeah, a more information experience when they come to your website rather than a, than, than a book today. So, yeah. you know, you just have the phone number there on your, uh, of course, a lot of practices have the book online uh, uh, button direct to their uh, to direct to their diary now. And, you know, there are those patients, but there are a lot more patients that, you know, don't want to book today and, and want more information. And I think websites, well, certainly I find the last couple of years, the websites that we have designed have, have, have worked more like that rather than the, uh, than, than the quick quick fix. Sure. I think an, another mistake people make is they forget that they're a local business. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think obviously if you want to be nationwide or international, I have nothing against that, but you really have to build up a strong local presence either by having, you know, letting people know where you're located at, because that's where you're going to show up high in Google. And then if you want to build out other kind of areas, we serve pages and then yeah. sort of send traffic there as well. Yeah, so Google my uh, Google my business is really an essential uh, essential uh, to uh, to post on and have your uh, have uh, uh, to regularly update, uh, and certainly helps with the Google SEO as well. Uh, but it is a very good way. Uh, and again, if anybody's Googled anything recently, obviously paid ads come up first, and then local businesses come up in the second or third sort of position, and then the normal. Uh, the normal websites then will will will, will eventually sort of come up. Exactly. So uh, if you're in Google My Business uh, listing, and I think both you and I, Jim, have of on our sites uh, uh, free information about what you need to do in terms of setting up and why it's pretty pretty essential to uh, to do the Google My Business uh, mm -hmm. because, as you say, that's going to be one of the first things that come up when people are searching locally. And of course, uh, everybody's on their phone now. 60, 70% of traffic coming through phones now, is it? Yeah, a ton, a ton of traffic is coming through the phones. Um, another quick point about Google My Business is that sometimes people are don't necessarily know that, let's say you have two different clinics and two different providers, you don't just have one Google My Business page. There's mm -hmm. four now associated with your practice and how you dole out where the reviews go or you know where you kind of send people. You know, Tying your website to your Google My Business page is huge these days because basically, you know, since you have Google Analytics installed on your website and then you're trying to use your Google My Business page, those two things are going to talk together based off of like what's installed as far as the code goes. So if you don't have, if you're sending like a directions page or a, a link page, you know, from your Google My Bit, you know, from your homepage, from your website to your Google My Business and it doesn't line up, let's say, you know, you have two location pages on your website, you should send the Google My Business page of that location to that page on your website and yeah. making sure that's tied and will really help you in the rankings. Yeah. And I mean, that's exactly the same then, of course, then if you have a, uh, you know, if a page on a blog or a page on the website that uh, talks about, say, heel pain or, you know, bunions and, and that person clicks a link, it has to go to then that bunion page or has to go to the, whatever it's been referenced through. It's got to be cross link through. Uh, other, otherwise people, uh, uh, people don't spend the time on your on your on your website. No, they'll just bounce off your website. And uh, like you said, though, like it has to be you basically have to win the Internet for that page. Right. Like so you want to have the best bunion surgery page like in your local area. 
so that people will stay on there, read it. Because like yeah. I said, Google knows how long they're staying on your page. And if you're they're staying on for two seconds and you're they're staying on your competitor's website for two minutes, where do you think they're gonna wanna send the traffic? Yeah, I mean, I just, I mean, a very simple, easy thing to do is just to have a look at four or five of your competitors' websites uh, around the same time. And normally they're all exactly the same. And uh, again, we used to trade people with that. And we show people we do do reviews, and all the websites just make the similar same sim, similar issues. I mean, they're all just quite generic with a phone number, uh, mm -hmm. all about the practice and the person. Uh, not really, or sorry, about the the practitioners and the services. Uh, and again, don't really engage with the uh, with the person themselves. So, um, people have heard about having an avatar or having the ideal patient. And then building the sort of the website around that, and, and of course you don't have to be specific with one patient. Uh, it does make things easier, but you know if you are going for a sort of more sort of sports niche or, or surgery niche, uh, you may want to sort of tailor that. And uh, let me see, we've got this here. We've got a question from David. Jim, with GMB, should the providers have a separate GMB page for the practice and function in parallel? That's a great question. Um, so basically what I would recommend is if you're a one person practice, I would kind of have that be combined. So let's say your uh, Milwaukee like foot center and your you know, Dr. David Lorino, like that would just be one. But the time, once you get two practitioners, like what you wanna do is obviously now you have three, you go from one to three. But what I would say is that if you're driving for, if you're driving reviews, um, or you're trying to kind of like build up kind of your main Google My Business profile for your practice, you should really focus on getting the reviews for the practice first. Um, and then once you have maybe over 100 or 150, then it's time to maybe like start siphoning some of those down to the individual practitioner level. Um, but that's a good place to start is start with kind of one main one. And then as you get more providers, then you have to kind of build out more, uh, but really focus on the reviews on the practice itself initially. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we always find that one of the easiest way to ask for reviews is just to ask for one at the end of the appointment. Not many people ask. And there are sort of systems you can put in to automatically sort of send uh, you know, an email after. We find that open rates for those weren't very good. Uh, it's a little bit like having people uh, have their paperwork prepared and bring it with them. Uh, it tends to be a bit of a pain for them so they don't do it. Uh, and then you have to do it again anyway. So. Yeah, there can be different ways. What I find is probably the most beneficial is like uh, the software I use with with clients is called uh, GatherUp. Um, mm -hmm. So let's say you know they have a good the doctor has a good encounter with the patient he thinks is a good person to maybe provide a review. I don't just say like do email blasts and just send them out because you're right there'll be a low open rate with that. But if they're kind of warmed up to the idea in the practice about like you know you know did you have a great experience? We'd love to have you share. You know would you mind if I email or text you this? And then you know, an hour later, they get an email or a text. They're more likely to provide it, um, but I don't recommend trying to either email blast it out or put the pr put pressure on the patient in the practice. To say, hey, here's a, a you know, here's a tablet. Especially in the days of COVID nineteen, they kind of want to get in and get out, right? Especially nowadays. Um, but they they but I see re reviews and reputation stuff is kind of a digital form of word of mouth because if they have an ex excellent experience. They want to tell their family and their friends about you. Um, yes. you're, you're providing them a platform to do that. Yeah, and of course there are other sort of simple in-house ways of even just sort of giving them a card while they're leaving. And you know, would you mind? You know, if you have, if you know somebody who has a similar problem, you might you know think think about somebody who might have a similar problem and, and ask. A lot of people just don't want to ask for these sort of things. Yeah, it, it definitely takes maybe a little bit of staff training and just to feel comfortable with it. But you are providing a high level of care to people. And if you really want to take great care of as many people as possible, you have to be visible to them either online or in the real world um, to be an option for them to provide those services. So like while we didn't, you know, I went to a very hospital based uh, residency program. Where I didn't kind of learn these things. Right. So. Um, it can sometimes be a little bit of an adjustment. Like, I'm presuming that in the, you know, the, again, they, like the training here in in Europe, UK, and Ireland, in in the in the uh, in the states, as you say, most people would go into a hospital, would be going into a hospital sort of uh, setup, so there wasn't really any need for uh, any business sort of training. 
Yeah, I mean, we had a practice management course in podiatry school uh, at Shoal in Chicago where I went. But besides yeah. that, I mean, I, I spent some time in the clinics of my providers, uh, of my uh, the people who trained me during residency. But it wasn't like I was necessarily like totally on the front lines to see what that entire patient experience was like, right? Like, I didn't get to experience like, how do they find my practice? And then how did after I provided them care, how did I follow up with them and help educate them and help them? Yeah. Obviously, they would come back into the clinic. Yeah, you're, you're, you're a bit in the middle. Well, that's the most important thing, right? You have to have the the quality of care and the way you treat them in your clinic is is hugely important, right? None of this stuff works unless they have a great care experience. But you know, eighty percent of the con the touch points or the contact points with the patient either happen usually before or after um, they're actually in your clinic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we find yeah, especially the way we sort of structured the uh, the whole sort of front desk experience before that that made a, a huge difference at the uh, at the through that sort of pre-framed the patient about how things were going to sort of work right, uh, right through on the uh, on, on the journey. Uh, so you say yeah, so you got to have the presence, then you got to have the trust, which is where the sort of the reviews come in, uh, and then the next part was the. So there's the foundation, there's the uh, discovery, you know, like, so whether, like we, we talked a little bit about that as far as being visible in the maps, you know, as far as maps go, you're really going to kind of be best for the actual like zip code or the kind of town you're located in on maps. It's going to be very hard for you to rank high, you know, two towns over within the maps itself. Yeah. Um, but when it comes to the organic search, like I talked about, if you build out these areas we serve pages, um, let's say like you're a podiatrist serving like uh, like like Willamette, Oregon, or you know Salem, Oregon, but you're not located there. If you have a the best page about you know foot and ankle surgery for that town, you could rank number one in the organic search, and that's usually an area that people trust the most is that organic area along with the maps. Mm -hmm. um, but really, it's about a, a discovery strategy should be about that entire first page of Google. Uh, of the results page. So while maps and the organic are important, the first thing people are going to see, um, and you may feel like you're the person that ignores it or you never click on ads, but they do work. Otherwise, Google wouldn't have them there. Um, is this search, you know, this kind of search, um, Google search ads? You know, we're not talking about interruption. We're not talking about something you didn't look for. This mm -hmm. is matching search intent with someone in your local area, whether it's podiatrist near me or Salem, Oregon podiatrist, they are looking to have that done. So while you want to definitely build a long-term relationship, like you talked about with ways as far as providing information, there is a certain segment if you're in a big uh, area where you can kind of, uh, you know, SEO and discovery and organic, that takes a long time. Uh, but the positive thing about ads is that you can kind of like hit the ground running almost that same day. Yeah, I mean, ads are very simple. I mean, and I mean, you can go from. Uh, I mean, I, I started off with, and I know other colleagues who we've worked with since have, uh, have started off. With, it's very easy to do a very sort of simple Google ad. You could probably do it in about an hour or so yourself. I mean, it's. it's, it's yeah, but you got to be careful though, right? Like if you're if you're trying to advertise on your budget, you don't want to burn through your budget in a couple of minutes. And, what? Like what Google is going to do everything that they can, though, to try to make you spend as much money as possible. Right. So if you don't know that you can actually make it be a five mile d diameter or you you realize that if when you type in heel pain in your local area, that like Dr. Scholl's and all these multinational companies are advertising on these terms. So, well, yes, it is easy. It's also super easy to burn through your money for not doing it right. So, yeah. But again, there is sort of some simple advice out there. But uh, yeah. We, to, to, to get slightly more advanced, but you know, it is a very good way of just turning on and off uh, clients. Uh, I mean, it does make the uh, it does make the phone ring, and uh, it's uh, yeah, Google AdWords. I mean, I, I built my pretty much fifty or sixty percent of my practice and the practices in Dublin was built off uh, referrals from uh, from from Google. Uh, from Google AdWords, and so we're pretty familiar with it, and it was it was it was fantastic. You know, thinking back, I should have probably used it more. <laughs> should have spent more when it was cheaper. Sure. Uh, because yeah, as you say, certain key keywords and things are quite uh, quite expensive to use. And uh, I think I've talked about this a number of times over my uh, over the last year or so. I mean, people just think that patients just appear, and you know, especially if you're working for somebody else. Uh, you just think the patients appear in the practice in a puff of smoke. You don't see everything that's gone on 
previously and the cost of actually getting the patient to sit in front of you. Uh, so people get scared of stuff like patient acquisition cost. Mm -hmm. How much does it cost for them to sit in front of you? You know, most people just think it's a phone call and a, you know, and a, and a 30 second conversation to book the appointment. But, you know, they could have been looking at your website for a year or two or, and competitors and, you know, look, read, read your blogs and all sorts of things. Again, us as clinicians just think of, again, patients just pick up the phone, decide one day I'm going to get this foot pain fixed and, and, and pick up the phone and ring. Uh, that's not normally the uh, that's not normally the process. If you actually bother to listen to your patients who are sitting there with two three years of heel pain and have been to different practitioners and tried different things, their whole journey to get to actually sit in front of you in the clinic has been quite a quite a quite involved uh, over time. No, for sure. Yeah, it just doesn't just doesn't happen. And uh, and then so we and. You work a lot, quite a lot with sort of then patient sort of retention while they're in the practices then and follow up after because obviously it's more about, uh, you know, the long term value of the patient is, is, is important for the practice. Well, like I said, there's, you know, there's things that have to be kind of figured out, I think, before you Im implement an online marketing plan, right? You have to know, number one, like who you are and what kind of patients you want to see, you know, what yeah. makes financial sense for your business. What are the financials of your practice, right? Like, you know, does it, you know, what is a general lifetime value of a patient or what is the first visit usually that, you know, what is that that value? So knowing those things beforehand um, puts you in a better spot to know that, oh, yeah, I'd be willing to pay like $50 to acquire a patient, which it doesn't seem like such a big deal um, after you do those numbers. If you're just saying like, I just want to do online marketing and then, you know, for someone like me that takes a real hands on approach, I'm a one man shop. Right. And probably like yourself, I don't know if you, how, big, how big of a team you have. Um, but you know, three thousand dollars a month is not a huge amount of money to spend um, if you're getting consistent patient flow. Yeah, I mean, we were we were getting we were spending, but it, it, it depended for every pound we spend, we, we spend we got about six or seven, six to, well, six to ten back, depending on how long the patient stayed and what sort of treatment options yeah. they fit into. So, I mean, uh, yeah, you've got to calculate that out. I mean, is, is, is that the sort of return that you're prepared to spend? So if you want to spend a thousand and get 10,000 back, I think most people would be doing that every day. <laughs> would they not? No, for sure. But you just have to know those numbers though, right? Yeah, yeah you got you got to know your numbers. Otherwise, uh, yeah, and then, I mean, some practices, again, it's not new patients. That are the, that are the thing. It's the retention of the, the patients that they already have, and that's what we do with practices when we first start. Is a lot of it is to to plug the holes in the bucket that's already in the practice. Then before we start to uh, before we start, because everybody goes, we, yeah, well, I want, I want new patients. What do you want new patients? But what's wrong with the patients that you've got? Because it's far easier to talk to and do more business with the patients that you already have than have to get somebody completely new who doesn't know I like, can trust you and hasn't used your service already. No, exactly. And that's where the kind of communication, whether it's educating patients through email newsletters or um, just kind of staying in contact with those people, because those are the people that are going to be your word of mouth people, either through a digital platform or just talking to people in a local network that, that like yeah. you, like you said, know, like, and trust you already. Yeah, especially now, you know, especially, especially now when, again, there isn't going to be as much, you know, ladies in at the bowling club at the weekend, or the right. you know the guys at the game uh, having a chat about who who they've just seen to be for for for, for their uh, for for their for their foot and ankle problem. So uh, there isn't going to be. So we're definitely going to have to have more of a, 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 a I think a more of an online presence. Yeah. Uh, and, and of course, then again, people think that all you, all you got to do is, is put up the website and, and have a Facebook page and, and post some things on Facebook and, you know, away you go. But well, like maybe like 2% of your Facebook followers are going to see those posts. You know, it used to be that back in the day, you put something on Facebook and everyone that followed you or all your friends saw it. But now, you know, Facebook wants to, it's a pay for play platform now, right? Um um, Facebook has its place and social media advertising has its place, but we can get into that in a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, uh, you don't want to talk about Facebook now. We can, if you want to. Yeah. No, well, it's, oh, cause what was it? Well, you wanted to go through the next stage then was, 
Uh, we, we've touched a bit on the communication, the email marketing. I mean, that's like I said, it's not, when you send out emails, it's not all about like uh, appointment now, appointment now. It's like, okay, it's a, maybe a quick blur about one of your uh, one of your procedures or the symptoms you treat. And then, a, you know, link to a website where they can learn more. Yeah. You know, obviously during COVID-19 times, you want to talk about you're open, you're taking all precautions necessary. And then yeah. maybe a testimonial or social proof somewhere in that email. It doesn't have to be some book where they're in front of the computer for 10 minutes. It should be a nice, something that's scannable, that makes yeah. you look professional, and then they can interact if they choose to. Yeah, we changed ours up. We did, we did, we, we, we sent an email at least once a week. I mean, and again, a lot of people worry about or fi trying to figure out when we talk about this, is how, where are they going to, what are they going to talk about to patients or what are they going to post? And right. Content is obviously important. Uh, but but again, it was just like you know what what we're doing today, what what we did this week, the, the walk that we were we plan we did last you know last Sunday we went for a walk and saw this lovely waterfall and the trees were really nice and we could do this because we didn't have foot pain and and talk to them about you know such and such happened in the practice this week and oh this is the new research paper that we're reading some people are really into that no for but sure again, talk, talk to them talk to them you know again like your favorite patient or your auntie Mary who's your you know your patient avatar it doesn't have to be all it isn't all about sort of like sales or or, or or keep pushing it all the time it's just a friendly chat and then when you do have an offer uh or you do have something that you want to promote or a new service in your practice then it makes it an awful lot easier because you're just not taking all the time no exactly you want to give 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 right so yeah, yeah. so sure. what does Gary V talk about jab 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 and then punch i mean it's 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 a, it's a, it's a long, it's a longer, it's a longer process. Yeah. Well, that's the, that's the goal though, right? Is to develop long-term trust and long-term relationships with patients. You know, it's not just like get in that new patient, charge them up and then like never see them again. Right. It's like, you want to develop a practice that just kind of like snowballs, you know, as it goes on, you have people that know, like, and trust you and they bring more of those people into the practice and just kind of gets on a momentum of its own. Yeah, because a lot of that is, I mean, again, I'm sure we've all worked in practices where we look down the list and it's, oh my goodness, that, that delightful patient's in that I never want to see again. I think you go for that 80-20 rule, you know, the 20% of your patients bring you 80% of your business and 20% of your patients give you 80% of your headaches as well. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, again, I mean... W we, we were in a nice position then when you when you have that sort of control or you have that sort of practice that you can uh, have developed and, and you know build the practice the way you want then you don't have to deal with these sort of patients and, you, and again you don't have to do the procedures that you don't uh, particularly like yourself if you're if you're not single-handed then of course if you're in a group somebody else may have that sort of more skill set yeah uh, but it's uh yeah, again, it's 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 so much easier now to 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 develop the practice in the uh, in 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 the direction that you actually want to work in yourself, for sure. Other than just be sort of like generalized, um, and so the next stage is. Well, we kind of jumped over reputation. We talked about reviews a bit. Um, okay. like how, the most important thing about reviews, I would say, before we jump on to promotion, is that. It is a huge ranking factor for Google when they when you have 100 or 200 reviews, right? If you have beyond 200, I'm not sure that you're going to get much juice from that. Yeah. But it's also kind of what I'd say like a conversion signal for patients. So if they're looking down the list of, on maps or someplace and a uh, competitor practice has seven reviews and you have 170, like there's a switch that goes off in patients' minds saying that like, well, even if seven has a 5.0, I'm going to go with like the 170 and the 4.8 because like number one, 4.8 feels more real than 5.0, but also just like it's a numbers game in a way uh, with reviews. You, you do that. I mean, again, any, anybody who sits there and thinks they don't do that when they go to download an app and they automatically look how many downloads there's been in the score on it. Or if you go and look at a review of a product that you're going to buy on, on Amazon or, or somewhere like that, automatically that just sort of happens in your uh, yeah. In, 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 in your mind and you're more likely to go to, uh, to go to there as well and but again people are, will go to two or three different sites maybe sure especially in their healthcare and, and especially now because they do want there are really you know they're they're not just going to take the first person that they sort of will tend to sort no. of come across but it puts yeah. you in the running though right like it makes you an option as opposed to like that 
clinic that's 5.0 that has six where it's not even an option. So when you yeah. kind of facilitate, facilitate those Google reviews, you give your, your, yourself a chance to be up there. Um, yeah. And then once maybe you tap out, you're like at 170 or 200, then it's time to consider either if you have multiple providers feeding off some of those so the individual provider profiles go up higher um, yeah. or you know switching over to different platforms that have a little less um, and no, they're no less important, you know, like, but they're just, they're not going to send a ranking signal to Google, like health grades or vitals or ZocDoc or other places. I mean, if you have a ton of reviews, you can do that. Or let's say you get a, a one star on health grades, you know, for a few weeks, you could switch it over where you kind of like <laughs> kind of help reduce the negative impact of that negative result. Yeah. Um, I mean, how, how have you helped or how have you Sorry, what do you think the best way is to do is to deal with the sort of negative sort of feedback or review? Yeah. So the first thing you obviously have to be is um, you have to kind of go play by the guidelines as far as like HIPAA compliant things, not reveal any health uh, or personal information about the person. Right. But they definitely needs to be confronted in a helpful and positive way. I think the first step would be if, if they put their name down there, right, is like determine whether you can kind of take care of it behind the scenes with that person to really understand what happened uh, and w can you resolve it kind of not in a public forum to start off with. Um, it yeah. definitely needs to be addressed, um, but that would be the first step before you respond online is to say, okay, like talk to the staff member or whatever the complaint was and see if there's a way to kind of offline have a conversation with that patient to see if they can rectify it. Um, and then maybe if they're willing to, they, you know, I wouldn't ask for this right away, but if they're willing to either change or update their review or take it down, um, yeah. That's not an option. Usually it's not an option. Usually when people go on, they're like, their heels are dug in most of the time, right? So I mean, when somebody left a, a negative comment on a post, on a Facebook post, 18 months after they visited the practice. So that's how long it had been niggling away at them for. So I don't know, again, whether it just popped up in their feed. Yeah, they were like, and then they commented on it or whether they'd been sort of like waiting around. But yeah, 18 months later after... You know, and how are you supposed to, well, of course, we, we phoned and spoke to them. and We will do that first. And then if that's not, if that's, if that's not, yeah, but that's, yeah, but that's, I mean, that's, that's the old thing, isn't it? That, you know, one person, you know, somebody with a good, uh, good a good experience to tell one person and somebody with a bad experience will what, tell seven, is it nine others? <laughs> No, for sure. Um, but like, like I said, if that's not successful, kind of in the back, the kind of back uh, channels aspect of things, then you have to kind of say, okay, let's say it was a billing issue, right? You just kind of talk about like these, are, you know, we care deeply about our patients. These are, you know, our this is the way we bill. Um, you don't really confront that person and say like you're bad or you didn't listen to us. Like, you know, we have a disagreement. This is what we do, and then you know that's. You just kind of put it out there so other people can see your side of things. You're not trying to make the other person look bad or say that they're necessarily yeah. like 100% in the wrong, but you just say, just lay out kind of how you approach treating your patients in a, in a great way. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I've got some friends in, who have restaurants, and of course, when they were open, uh, I mean, they literally would have people you know, smiling and saying, yeah, the food was great and leaving a review as they're leaving the restaurant under the table. Yeah. I mean, Connor, my friend, just around the corner, he was like, imagine you had everybody come in and left you a review as they were just literally leaving. <laughs> it will relieve reviews for restaurants pretty quickly and, and for other services. But medical services don't, don't, know, don't seem to be as quick off the mark. That's a good thing. Well, like we said, right, like I was trained in a hospital, you know, it's kind of like it feels not uncomfortable, but it's not something I was trained at as far as how to ask a patient for a review. So something you have to practice, you have to have a system for because um, they like I said, if you're providing great care, they're going to want to spread it to, the, to, to people that they, you know, in their network and that they care about. So they get the same kind of care. But I'd also say the worst thing that can be done, and you see this a lot online, is that you need to respond to all reviews, both positive and negative. It's not just the negatives that need a response. You need to thank patients for the time they put into it. Um, and, Cause like, if there are uh, keywords being in left in reviews, let's say someone says like, I had the most amazing surgery with, you know, Dr. Blake, like that surgery and Dr. Blake are now like kind of two keywords there. Uh, and that can help you rank for things like surgery and such in the future. Yeah. And then other ways of improving a billing reputation? Um, obviously, you want to make sure that um, you're paying attention to these kind of what I call like satellite websites, right? Whether it be Yelp, Health Grades, you just have to have some general sense of like, 
what are people saying about you on places that are not Google or your own website? If you're completely oblivious and you have a 0.5 star rating on some website and you're not kind of like taking an active approach um, to kind of com combating that or to kind of like, you know, obviously you're providing great care. Um, you really need to be aware of what's out there. So at the very least, making sure that all the clinic information you have online, uh, the name, the address, the phone number is kind of, you know, yeah. You don't have like there's different services that'll do it as a one off, which I recommend. Uh, but you don't need to have something that's going to charge you like two or three hundred dollars every month to do that stuff. No, 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 it should be just a one off. Again, yeah, there was there was a few different sites in Ireland. Again, it's amazing how people will link sort of through or how will they eventually get to find you. But uh, there's a really good one in Ireland, the UK called Rate My Area, which goes down through even to the like the you can specify the bus that passes outside <laughs> the door. And nobody really knows about it, but it used to give sort of like pretty regular referrals. Yeah. Uh, and then there are other, uh, I don't know whether it's large enough in Canada. I know one of the offices is based in Dublin, but there's a site called What Clinic, which was quite a good referral. Okay. Uh, an international sort of referral. I have international patients from that flying into Dublin. Uh, and they were about seven, you know, seven euros, so about 10 bucks a, a referral was a paid referral. But yeah, sort of things like Yelp, uh, Golden Pages. Uh, which is yellow pages here. They're still around, <laughs> and they, uh, uh, so, and, and and a couple other referral sites are, are you know as you say just have the have the information on there and it just does uh, it gets you around everywhere and um, yeah those yeah what kind of was quite a good referral but we'll get on to paid stuff later and I suppose then also then I mean even offline building up uh, even going along to those. Uh, sports events or any local sort of charity stuff or you know talks and evenings and uh, i know that's difficult now but again i mean i've just been approached about and i've just moved it on to a colleague one of the local diabetic areas units wanted to sort of a little bit of advice and you know sure. they're going to that was zoom with patients on a, on a zoom stuff uh, again any practices now who aren't doing any sort of uh I mean, even sort of simple sort of falls prevention or sort of stretching classes or, you know, strengthening stuff for their patients or a little short video or a, a little bit of advice and sending them out. Uh, you know, they're definitely missing a trick at the moment, aren't they? I think you're making up a good point is that, um, you know, when you get, obviously there's certain links that um, you're never going to get, right? So in the U.S. right now, there's some companies that have websites that kind of for their medical device, right? So unless you have like this, this word device or you have this, bunion procedure you're not going to show up on every single directory because some of them actually are private directories um where uh, there's a company in the us called trace and some other ones where you're not going to show up on their directory unless you're uh doing a procedure with their hardware um but building right. links like you mentioned whether you're let's say you're the team podiatrist for a university um whether you're like uh you know you gave some money to a specific um, youth sports league, or you're sponsoring the local chapter of the Di Di Diabetes of America or the UK or something. If you get a link from a, a website that has what they call a high domain authority, um, yeah. that will help build, bolster your own website to rank even higher. So, you know, getting these genuine links from uh, you know from other uh, local businesses is definitely something to aspire to. Whether you have time for it in your practice, or that's something that is going to be taken care of by the service so provider you work what with. You're doing now in the evenings, apart from watching Netflix, and wasting your life away. I mean, you know, again, yeah, simple stuff like that, or you know, as you say just a, a link. You know, if you get over the local soccer or or, or, or team uh, website into their Facebook groups, uh, you know. Um, that all helps to build that sort of social uh, sort of capital that you need. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and, and again, you know, there, there can only be then one sort of practice in your town who's actually helping with the soccer stuff and, and having that sort of like having that sort of profile. So uh, it, it does take a little bit of work to try to try, try to become sort of present. Uh, and, and again, yeah, people say they don't have time for this. I don't know what they've got time for. Uh, you know, got time for another diabetic talk in an evening. I've not maybe not have time to listen to us two talking about how to how to get more bums on seats in their in 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 their practice. Uh, so uh, yeah, it, it it takes work, but I think it's it the well it's it, it's certainly a lot easier now. It should be easier now with uh, with everything more online. Yeah. 
Yeah, and uh, people spending more time online. And do you do much across all the other platforms in terms of sort of like you know Twitter or, or Instagram? You know, for right now, like I focus more on what I call like the high re rate of return in, uh, of of kind of a, a marketing investment. Um, like I said, like I kind of stay off of social unless it's uh, something paid, and mostly. Yeah. Uh, with kind of display advertising on social or talking mostly about Google display or Facebook. Um, but honestly, like I think those social platforms are at least when it's an organic standpoint, it's something where maybe there's a younger person on staff that takes pictures of the staff and kind of other things where it shows a little you're, bit of you're, personality. You're, it's TikTok. I mean, not seeing. <laughs> no, I'm I too mean, old for that kind of stuff. I, I tried to go on there for a little bit, and I'm just like, uh, it made me feel about 75 years old when I was on TikTok. Uh, no, I would check it out again. I mean, there's quite a lot of the adverts uh, there yeah. uh, doing a lot of sort of surgical stuff. Well, yeah. If you want younger patients, it definitely is probably a great way to do that. Um, if you're looking for you know, your demographics more in the 40 or over uh, category, you're probably not going to get a lot of throughput there on TikTok. Yeah. Okay, well, I would think it's uh, well. It, it's interesting the moment in terms of sort of organic reach and stuff. I have a a side gig, <laughs> which isn't going to do with podiatry. I get sixty five, seventy thousand views on some videos. Okay, uh, it's uh, which you got the same on the podiatry side of stuff, <laughs> two or three thousand, but nothing like that. Uh, but again, that drives then you can use that to drive traffic to Instagram or drive it into your link tree or into your YouTube channel or into your sort of practice yeah. stuff. And there's some quite innovative practices on there, uh, giving a lot, giving a lot of good advice. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm not against it. I just think that there's probably higher. You know, I think the biggest scarcity that all of us have, whether you're in practice or you're actually uh, providing services, is time scarcity. And what I find is that, like, at least for me right now, unless someone can show me, like, the kind of five things I focus on are probably. I spend a lot of time researching it. It's kind of like the most kind of bang for your buck, at least to begin with. I think there's huge opportunities in YouTube and Facebook and other places, but this is kind of what I found so far. Yeah, no, no, well, that's a, that's a, that's it. I mean, most people are time scarce, so they do want to see where they're going to get the biggest return for the least uh, the, the least expenditure. Yeah. So you've got to put a bit of work into it. I mean, I'm talking about physical time expenditure, not, sure. just, not, not just money expenditure. But yeah, certainly Google, certainly, so if people don't, haven't kept up, Google paid ads, so Google advertising and Facebook paid ads, are, are the way to go. Uh, although we found again, uh, the Facebook was easy, or Google was easier because basically you just drove them from a heel pain page to the heel pain page on your website to book the appointment today. Yeah. Uh, the Facebook tended to be, well, we tended to be a bit more, we, were, we ended up a bit more creative. When it, when it comes to Google and Facebook, though, I would say there's a, to me, in my mind, there's a huge difference between search advertising and display, which is both Google display and Facebook, which is an interruption style of advertising. Well, Google ads, people have gone looking for it. I've got a pain in my foot in Dublin or I've got a pain in my foot in Quebec. Yeah. Facebook is just, it comes up in the feed and it's just sort of more interruption. So the conversion tends to be less. Yeah. Well, certainly when we were targeting, I think one of us said my one was, was and I just pushed, it was, we had a, we, we A-B tested it. So it was the exact same, sort of to the same group, the same, so it was targeted to, uh, uh, to, to women over 30 who were, who had registered for, uh, for one of those mini marathon, one of those cancer sort of mini marathon 10Ks. And that, that was the demographic group in Dublin. And, uh, one ad was just free foot scan with your first appointment, and then the second ad was, "Do you want, do you want to learn how to run the mini marathon without completely dying? You know, sign up for this free report." Yeah, one booking for the free foot scan, uh, 132 free reports in the first two days. <laughs> so, which one worked? No, yeah. exactly. The free with free report. So. Uh, now again, then not all those patients. I think we had four patients converted from that. Yeah, so that was for ten or fifteen euros spent, so it wasn't a huge amount of money. Yeah, yeah but again, that again, that's longer term, and I think that's also the thing about people is that they want to spend something today or put an ad on today, and the phone rings tomorrow, and this is to fill the book for next week. Right. Uh, when you take it longer term. Like again, that person coming back and commenting after eighteen months. We've had patients who have 
we can see they've taken an ebook two years ago and they've opened every email that, that they've had and we've spoken to them and sent them postcards or different offers along the time. It's maybe taken a year or two years or more for them to actually come to the clinic. Mm -hmm. So it is building that know, like, and trust over a longer period of time. No, for sure. I think there's really two use cases where I think display and Facebook is definitely uh, can do things that search advertising can't do. Number one is that there's certain terms or certain services you're providing that, pa that patients aren't actively looking for. Uh, whether it's like a ward treatment or something. Obviously, there are certain uh, healthcare rules in both Google and in Facebook that you can't violate. You can't like talk directly to someone or ask a question um, that's going to like make them feel targeted and you don't want to do that. Uh, but that's one way is if you have, you know, maybe you want to up your surgery uh, load. Maybe it's a, so maybe it's an image of you being the surgeon that's on this, you know, Facebook ad. Um, and then the second thing is basically, like you mentioned too, with your mini marathon, is that if there's a certain demographic of people in your local area that you think would be good patients or the type of patients you want to treat, you know, providing them something of value, whether it's a free report or a download, um, but you can just target. This is just part of, I think a lot of people, again, don't have a plan. Right. The mini, the mini marathon was always June bank holiday weekend, first weekend in June. So this is. But we, so the mini marathon ad went out eight weeks before that. True. I mean, uh, now at this time of year, would have been already been through the skiing stuff and out of the back end of sort of skiing and winter sports. Yeah. Uh, not that we have any in Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got a mountain here at the back. Well, Chris, Brent Christopher says it's not really a mountain, it's only 480 meters. So it's not, okay. It's a hill. We did get some snow last weekend. Which made a pretty picture postcard, but you know, at this stage now, then it's it's getting ready. This is the promotions now would be coming through. The plan now would be coming through. Uh, you know, Valentine's Day plus then, and also what are you going to start doing for sort of spring and those sort of like sort of training tips, pre-season training tips, and so there would have been sort of three or four different. You know, you've got to have your 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 news sort of cycle here, St. Patrick's Day stuff, your Easter stuff, and this is all built in. And you already know, I already knew which ad I was going to be running in, in June and July, which is going to be the back to school stuff for September time. So it was a whole plan. I don't think people have a plan really. It tends to be a very scattered one, doesn't it? No, exactly. That's the thing you find out when you take over some of these accounts for clients is they just yeah. they're just kind of doing a shatter scout of everything. They've been told they need to do certain things. So they kind of hire someone to kind of do it like this, without a plan. You've seen something like this decided today's the day they're going to go off and run a google ad <laughs> and they're uh yeah it's just uh it's just uh yeah it's gotta it's gotta be planned and it's gotta be it's gotta be worked out because again the most practices and that's what i wanted to do with my practices i hated that uh the really busy weeks followed by then the, the you know the the, the the really quiet weeks and sure for cash flow and practices and paying wages at the end of the week, it's not a very good way to run a business. So no. but certainly with the way we develop the practice over time, we're able to to, uh, to level out those peaks and troughs. I mean, one of the guys I used to work for before the practices was always of the opinion, well, of course, it does get a little bit busier in January, but then people don't start coming out till March. And, and then it was like, well, then it's Easter. And okay, well, then we're not going to do anything in the summer because everybody's away on holidays, and then it's back to... <laughs> There's always an excuse. Huh? What are you going to do anything? What are you going to do anything? It's, uh, yeah, it's not... Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, you know, it's it, doing something consistently and, you know, is... is uh, and, and, ha and having just a sort of small plan. I mean, I think people spend more time, well, they used to, spend more time on organizing their sort of family holiday than they would be organizing the back end of their uh, well now there's no holidays right so <laughs> it's plenty of time to uh plenty of time to uh just to spend on developing the practices then exactly yes for a while we need some sun soon tell me about it but no you definitely have to have a plan so even if it's just a one-off sort of plan and test things and see how it works up to like a very sort of complicated make it as complicated or as easy as you like but you have to have a plan or what you want to get from it no exactly that's where it should all start with because again i've done that advertising before the local newspaper or the local the local running magazine or the running magazine in dublin comes up i remember there was a new rugby magazine i didn't have a plan 
you know, so the guy talked me into spending, you know, a thousand or fifteen hundred on advertising over a couple of months. Didn't get any patience out of it. And then you go, it's a waste of time. Yeah, exactly. It wasn't structured and wasn't planned. And and then, you know, had that patient that came in six months later rather than the week after the magazine came out. Did uh did you take into account that he was part of your advertising for that? Or, yeah, again, for the for the for the longer burn patients. No, for sure. Uh, and then obviously that building up that sort of recognition in the local area as well is is, is worthwhile doing. I mean, do you, do you still, because I got away from and I don't tend to recommend, I don't really talk to family practitioners, do you call them in the? Yeah, that's what they call them in the States. Um, you know, I think it's it's one of those things where. General practitioners we call here, they tend to be the gatekeeper. Family doctors, G GPs. Yeah. So my He's thing is that. Yeah, well, I, they, they didn't. Well, they had they, some refer, but they didn't refer the amount of effort that we used to put in. Sure, to the referrals, we didn't bother talking to them. I mean, well, I think when people are first starting practice, right, they have more time than money sometimes. Yeah. Um, so that makes sense to at the very beginning, if you're going to be in a local area for a long time, it's a long term plan. That's a time to go out and, and meet people, shake some hands, and provide some value to the other healthcare providers to let them know who you are, so you have some awareness. You know, as a practice gets busier, and there's probably a inflection point there where they're better off being in the clinic and seeing the patients. That's when it's time for someone like you or me to come along. I think the digital should always play a role, um, but to kind of ramp up or scale up things makes sense once they have kind of more money than time uh, at their disposal. Yeah, smart people spend money to save time, Jim. Apparently, yeah, delegation is a good thing. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think, and again, there's not something, something that you know, that, that, that somebody else in the practice may be better at than you are your, your, yourself. I mean, I think again, practitioners worry that they're they're they don't have that expertise, and hence where somebody like you and I come in once you've got it as far as you can with with advice off, you know, YouTube. Uh, yeah, you want to kind of like talk to an expert who's in the trenches and doing it on a daily basis just so they can understand because it's it can be a bit of a blind spot for people, right? Like they didn't go to school with this. They haven't, they don't have daily familiarity with the tools like we do. So if we can, have, like, that's my main thing, right? Is like, even if people don't hire me to be a client, uh, you know, to come on with me as a client, I really just want to educate podiatrists to a level where they feel comfortable and know what these things are. So either they do it themselves or they hire someone like you or me, but they yeah. at least kind of have a, we're on a level playing ground. So I think yeah. some agencies are still, you know, I'm not saying that all are bad, but some do take advantage of this lack of knowledge of podiatrists and they're getting charged, you know, $5,000 a month for things like social media management on an organic standpoint. It's really not returning any, uh, in, any of their investments. So just helping them get to a level playing ground is kind of my, my whole yeah. thing. There does seem to be that either sort of difference for people who go to sort of one extreme where they want to go off to an agency and spend you know, 15, 20,000 on an old singing, all dancing website and package and something at the back end of it. Uh, and then, or else then want to build a site on a simple website builder that costs 20 or 30 quid. Um, right. I don't think they sort of understand what they're getting from what they do sort of things and how things sort of function. And again, Different people are obviously at different levels, uh, but you would have thought they'd be listening to some stuff over time. I mean, you know, I would I would say like a one page simple one page sort of website with your picture and your phone number on it isn't going to do it uh, compared to something that's slightly more uh, gives patients slightly more information. And I mean, you're all about e-responders and sort of free reports or giveaway. Well, if you take a look at my website, right, I've got uh, an email, give me your email, I'll give you a case study. Uh, yeah. I try to help out uh, other podiatrists by providing well, uh, free tips of what you can do to market your practice. You just sign up and get, you give those away. And again, that's what people, that's the way the information sort of trade works. And it works like that with sort of patients as, uh, work, work, should, should work like that with patients as well. Yeah. Uh, and again, you're not annoying the patients with the, sort of the follow up. You're informing them, and you're building the trust, and you're you're building that relationship with them. No, for sure. So when they do decide, or if when they do decide that they that they're going to have their foot problem sorted out, you're 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 as you say, if they if they've 
if they've seen a thousand or a couple of hundred reviews and the, and the, and the, and the videos and, and, and everything that about you on the website and, and you've been getting regular emails, they're more than likely to come to see you rather than the guy down the street who's got a one page and it's phone today. Right. I, I totally agree with you. Um, you know, when I think about the kind of the path, though, I mean, my I kind of diverged, right? And we kind of both got into marketing. But, you know, I think when you're when you get into this academic state of mind, I went to, you know, my university, my podiatry school, my residency, I was in a big kind of practice where I was sheltered for a period of time where I didn't have to touch yeah. this stuff. We kind of get used to these kind of very like clear markers, right? Like I graduated college, I graduated and then like you kind of have an idea, you, you want to get board certified. There's kind of very, there's external markers you have to kind of hit. But when it comes to practice management or building a practice, um, yeah, there might be some financial things you can kind of, kind of, uh, kind of aim for and try to hit. But there's not this like, I am the podiatrist now that I'm, I'm, I'm marketing the right way, right? There's, it feels like it's a bit of a fluid situation for people that are used to a very regimented kind of, um, you know, go, uh, whether not all these places teach entrepreneurship or marketing, right? So it's a bit, it can feel a little unsettling if you're very kind of a academic focus and you never really wanted to be a business person to begin with in a way. Yeah. You missed that meeting. You are a business person. As soon as you put your name on the door, yeah, that you're running a business. And again, you know, they, they are, you know, if you, you know, if you've got a receptionist and a or admin, some admin team, and some other sort of staff, and 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 uh, um, you know, again, if you're if you're if you've got to make wage at the end of the week, you're you're running a business. Yeah, and if you don't want to run a business, there's obviously in the U.S. there's big multi-specialty clinics, there's big hospitals that sometimes you get a job there and just kind of be an employee and not have to worry about this stuff. But the minute you go into private practice, like you're in this kind of competitive world where it's not only other podiatrists, there's other, you know, <laughs> product providers, there's other healthcare professionals that are going after the same kind of patients you are. I mean, I've talked about this before on talks. I mean, it's just that bunion problem, that heel problem. There's the option of the family physician, the, sur the orthopedic surgeon, right. the physical therapist. Uh, the lady down the butcher said she got this cream and rubbed it in. It was really good. Amazon said they're going to sell you this brace or insole. There's so many options right. that you want the person again to decide to come to see you because you're going to give them the best, uh, the, the, the best treatment and the best option for them. But and you've got to help them decide that. And, and again, I try to talk to people about what's the last thousand thousand dollar uh, you know item you bought, a sort of higher ticket item, whether it was a TV or a laptop or something. I mean, I, I review them. I know you you review them before you, you you know that patient journey, that flight to you know the next holiday you do plan. It will be you know check the hotels and check things and the flights and the trips that you're going to go on and and that will be sort of structured and 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 and, uh, and and planned on. People make the same choices when they're using the practitioner. I still don't understand why somebody just thinks it is poof. There he is, picked up a phone and phone him. No, you bring up a good point though there as well that um, you know we just we don't kind of make these one-off decisions, right? You want to build uh, relationships with people. Um, it's just one of those things where it just takes time to sometimes build up that trust. Yeah, it uh, just it just just it, it just, you just got to put a bit more time into it. Yeah. Uh, it has been time. And, and again, I've always, I'd always said, again, I've built practices badly and I've built practices slowly. Uh, you know, I think somebody will find their nation thinks, well, I'll spend 10 or 15 years till I get to the stage where I will uh, we'll be running a good practice. And there, there is a way to do that. But I didn't have the time. Yeah. And if you want to grow on scale, uh, well, the good thing about it was there wasn't an opportunity before 10, 12, 15 years ago to do this. I mean, if you were stuck in one town and you had the the door, the sign on the door and the uh, and the and the listing in the yellow yellow pages, that was it. No. Uh, it, social media and marketing allowed me to build, you know, a million dollar business. I mean, yeah. you, can, you, know, you can do that off. <laughs> you can do that off uh, ads and, and newspaper and, and marketing. I think I think part of the problem too is a perspective problem. You know, like it's not everyone does it, right? But we see the world from us as the provider of these services, and we know everything that we do. Um, so you really have to kind of jump into the patient's shoes and kind of walk down the patient journey, and then you're then these things make more sense. If you kind of come at from your own angle, you're going to see it as like I'm spending three thousand dollars a month on what? Like I just want to see patients. This house is helping me, but. 
like I talked about, like 80% of these kind of touch points are outside of your practice that you don't physically see. So you have to sit back and say, how do you go find a specialty provider? What are the steps that you take? Um, and kind of walk down that path as if you were one of your own patients yeah. and then it becomes more clear. Yeah, it's just, you know, th think of something that you need, you know, so, but just pretend you need to go and see a, 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 a hip specialist. Uh, an orthopedic hip specialist, then you, you know, you, you need to find a, a, a specific type of a, a accountant or, or you know, a solicitor. You're going to do your research in your local area. You're going to ask friends. You're going to look at reviews. You're going to sort of see. So people make the same choices with you. Uh, and, and again, we found that as well. I mean, that was on, one of the things that I read before was, uh, especially in the, in, the, in the health service where things are free, uh, if somebody is referred by a, by external practitioner and um, I think they think that's the finish of the journey where we found that that was I mean those patients weren't as educated as we find with the patients that come through us on, on a different way sure. uh, through through our marketing was the, these patients just being referred and they didn't know what they were getting they didn't know what to expect and we didn't find those as good quality as patients as one who had come through our uh, our other types of marketing because you just hadn't pre-framed them. They didn't know what to expect. Yeah, exactly. You hadn't kind of educated them along the course of that patient journey. I think that's a, a good point you bring up because also, you know, like you don't know, the, the patients don't know every procedure that you do or everything that you treat. So whether it's through communicating through email or just having conversations and letting them know you do different things. Like you'll sometimes hear, I've heard from some of my friends who are, or clients that, you know, I got sent back one of my own patients that didn't know that I did ingrown toenails, you know, like after before they were clients of mine, you know, one of their podiatry patients didn't know they did that. So they went to their PCP, but luckily they had that relationship with the primary care doctor that sent them back. But yeah, that was the, I mean, one of the guys who took over one of my practices a couple of weeks ago, he posted in one of the UK Facebook uh, groups was i've had a couple of patients in and you know they've, they've they've been off to the local physical therapist to get uh orthotics for i've been treating them for this and they got orthotics from them and they right seemed to know what i was doing yeah yeah so haven't you communicated to uh to them where they're you know you want to know should he put posters up in his uh in his clinic room if you're watching tommy you know <laughs> you should let me know how they could give you some advice but again, this is it. You just don't stick a poster up. It's again, right. it's all part of the marketing and how you talk to them. And you know, did the patient get a welcome email or letter that maybe say, "Oh, you've come to see us for a heel pain problem, but you know, we provide X, Y, and Z." Or right. this therapist is in the practice as well who looks after this and this, and we provide this and that. And again, it sometimes it can be a little bit over overload. We used to just have a one of the letter he letter heads just had along the side the services biomechanical and again nobody knows what a biomechanical assessment <laughs> is, so it didn't matter again, no it's good point. patients and that's why websites and emails and nf blogs and things need to speak to patients like they're a six-year-old yeah, yeah. Keep, keep it simple for them they don't know what a gait analysis is they do not know what a biomechanical assessment is don't know whether you saw one of my videos a couple of weeks ago. Alan from the coffee shop thought a biomechanical assessment is something you do in the car. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, rotate your tires have, and get a biomechanical assessment. Yeah, people don't know what a F scan is or a, a CR right. the X ray unit or a they don't, they don't care. They just exactly. want the outcome. You know, and I think a lot of practices think that if they put up where you got this qualification and we do this sterilization and we do everything else, I never asked my dentist that. I didn't even look at his website to go. I would take those sort of things as a given from a medically qualified person that we're going to providing a, you know, I presume you've got a degree. I presume you're, quality, you're cleaning and sterilizing. I presume you're doing all these COVID things. Right. Uh, and I don't care about your qualification. I think I just want to want what you can do for me. No, exactly. Yeah, I think that makes a big difference. But we jumped around enough. So there's building the trust. Well, we've jumped around. We've done all the five elements. We've kind of talked to some general topics. I think it's we've okay. done a, a lot here. So I mean, how do you think that? I mean, what, what? So if you could, would you start? Yeah, yeah, I just get people to start off with a plan. What do you want? And then it it, it, it tends to build from there. 
Right. I think what people think they want and what, what they need is slightly different. Um, I think people have a general idea of what the tools are there. They don't necessarily know how to use them in a strategic way that benefits their practice, right? Like everyone's familiar with Google search. Everyone's familiar with Facebook. Everyone's familiar with websites. So they have a certain level of knowledge, but they don't know how to use those things in a strategic way to benefit their practice. It's just, it's just, I want more new patients. It's like, great, we can get you no more new patients. So what, why do you need them? What are you going to do with them when you get them? Right. And so it's usually a financial thing, right? At the end of the day. Yeah. They need more. Uh, they need more. Uh, they need more money into their uh, into their practice because uh, yeah, you need to have more turnover. Uh, keep the whole show on the road. No uh, yeah, it's certainly challenging times now. No, for sure. I mean, like uh, whether it be uh, having to wait out in your car, uh, like at some clinics now, not sitting in the waiting room. I um, mean, yeah. you know, obviously. People are putting off care. There's some questions I have from clients. You know, is there going to be like a pent up demand once we're really open? Um, and it's I we've never been through this before, right? So well, yeah, practices that we talked to and stuff. Some of the better practices had the busiest July, August, September's than they ever had. Yeah, and uh, some practices didn't. Some practices closed, and they uh, yeah. Well, that's always the thing. Everybody always wants new uh, new patients. Yeah, new patient, but like you talked about previously, we want to make sure that we maintain and kind of build the existing relationships we have with our established patients because, those, like you said, you've already done a lot of the hard work with them to get them into your clinic and how to continue to provide value for them and value for their network of friends and family and uh, contacts. Yeah, that's one colleague we're working with in the UK. I mean, she had such a good business because uh, she was working in a private hospital and, and private orthopedic referrals. We didn't need to do any external advertising. We just needed to uh, talk to her referrers, the way she was grouped in, and uh, help her expand on our current base and, and, and things like offering, again, patient and affluent areas, second, third pairs of orthotics and rehab plans and, and, and add-ons onto what, they, what she'd already been providing. We didn't need to do any uh, external advertising, but she had come to me expecting that she had to do <laughs> <laughs> She's doing so well already. Well, that, well, that's why we talk to people, right? That's why we talk to our clients and see what their needs are and then seeing kind of what are the tools available. That's why I, I didn't I didn't talk about the five tools that I use to like build an online presence, right? These are like things that will evolve and change over time. Um, and each practice has their own goals and their own opportunities yeah. to explore. Usually once if you get new patients, then you need to fix this other issue and then this and that. I mean, it's, it all adds on. And I think that's why, yeah, bigger, as you say, bigger agencies are bigger sort of like, you know, pay your, pay your two or 3,000 and they look everything for it after you. And that's tend to be very, very cookie cutter. And it's just sort of like plug and play for for everybody and for every every industry. And it's, they just change the title on the, on the, on the, on the, on the blog in a way where they go. It's not sort of, uh, it's not practice. Specific. Well, they make their money on volume and not necessarily individual practitioner success, which I think is like a, a different model that you and I focus more on is like, how can we help out these individual practitioners grow their yeah. business? And I'm not going to work with 50 people at the same time, right? I'm not going to yeah. make a copy paste website, put one in this town and one in this town to go to yeah. volume. <laughs> See that when you work when you get with uh, certainly yeah you do sort of see yeah it's just the same website just <laughs> on different different times when you look across and uh, and of course patients aren't usually looking looking at that it's just us uh, marketing nerds exactly that's fine to say so Jim that was fantastic I'm sure there's a lot of information that people have had today I mean I I think we'll, we'll sort of have a plan just for sure things pick a patient uh, and then. It, you know, talk to talk, talk to them. Uh, how, how can people find out a little bit more about you, Jim? Yeah, so if they want to go to my website. It's podiatrygrowth.com. Um, you know, I've got some different case studies, and then I offer like a thirty-minute kind of free consultation to kind of give some people a direction or some opportunities that I see in their online presence that either they can take and kind of incorporate themselves, or you know, talk to me about uh, providing services in the future. Yeah, because again, as, as with patient people that I've spoken to over the last year or so, you know, with some people who have taken some information and have used it quite well. Sure. We may do something with them in six months or a year, but it's, it's not necessary. It's not necessary. There's so much information out there. Uh, it's, uh, it's it's just getting on actually uh, actually doing stuff. It isn't that scary. 
No, they shouldn't be intimidated, right? You know, like uh, whether it's your website or my website, I also have, you know, we, we, we both have articles about some of these topics where people can get like kind of a nice overview of it so they feel informed. So like I said, if they want to do it themselves or work with a professional like yourself or, my, or, or me, um, those are different opportunities they have. That's great. Jim, that was fantastic. All right. Uh, uh, well, I'm sure that uh, I will have uh, some of the, uh, the contact information up on the uh, uh, on the after. So you hold on. And thanks very much, everybody. And uh, we will uh, we'll talk to you next week. We'll see if you see Martin McGill, uh, who owns one of the large uh, orthotics companies in the UK and Ireland on next Friday. Uh, so we'll speak to you soon. And uh, we'll just 